Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Wednesday Wisdom on the Education Lady Podcast. We appreciate you tuning in today. First, let's hear from our podcast sponsors, and then we'll get to our guest. We want to thank Final Forms for their support of the Education Lady Podcast. Final Forms is the industry leader in registration, but Final Forms is more than just forms. It's a team, it's technology, and it provides schools with compliance, communication, and risk management solutions. Final Forms helps your stakeholders with mobile accessibility, and it has reminders for parents about policies, about physicals, and all the forms that go with being an athlete. Final Forms also helps with team communication and uh, attendance and even certification management for coaches. And for athletic directors, Final Forms can help with eligibility, with rosters, and all the reports that come across your desk. And it does this using secure language translation and ADA compliance. You know, it's time for you to talk to a team that's walked in your shoes. Take the next steps and find out what Final Forms can do for you and go to finalforms.com forward slash Jake. That's finalforms.com forward slash Jake to get started. We also want to thank Wall of Fame by Vital Signs. You know, they're on a mission to bring your school's legacy to life. They have a variety of interactive touchscreen consoles and an entire library of templates to help recognize the athletic achievements of your students, both past and present. Let them help you showcase your school's diverse history and your proudest moments and go to vitalsignswalloffame.com. You can also call them at 614-981-3589 or email them at sales at vitalsignswalloffame.com. That's sales at vitalsignswalloffame.com. Com. We also want to say thanks to Huddle. Remember at Huddle, we power sports. Over 200,000 teams use Huddle to help their teams play better using video and analytics. Huddle is the complete performance platform. They have online tools, smart cameras like the Huddle Focus. There's always been analytics, but there's so much more. Huddle is built for every level of play, from club and youth teams all the way through high school and college programs, and even the pros use Huddle to help their teams play at the highest level. You're in pretty good company with over 6 million users, including your student athletes and the coaches of the teams you're trying to get to recruit your kids. If you want to find out more about what Huddle can do for you and your program and how your school can become a Huddle school, go to huddle.com and talk to their professionals. Remember, at Huddle, we power sports. We also want to thank our newest sponsor, Area Scouts. Area Scouts provides athletes ages eight and up with state-of-the-art assessments and sport and movement specific development programs for all skill levels in all sports. Area Scouts also provides a one-of-a-kind worldwide online platform emphasizing sports-specific performance while focusing on athlete health and safety. And the best part, Area Scouts also works with youth, high school, and college coaches from across the country. Go to areascouts.com and enroll your athlete or your team in the base assessment program today. That's areascouts.com. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Wednesday Wisdom on the Educational AD Podcast. Our guest today on Wednesday Wisdom is Michelle Meyer. Michelle is the director of NIL for San Diego State University. She also founded the NIL Network. Uh, she's a former college athlete, uh, college coach, and uh, she is our go-to source for all things uh, NIL. Michelle, welcome back to Wednesday Wisdom. Thanks, Jake. Excited for another uh, conversation here. All right. Well, you and I were talking before we started recording. Um, you know, and again, we're recording this on uh, May 23rd. Uh, this past weekend, uh, a couple of big time college football coaches got into uh, a little bit of a uh, contest uh, uh, on the airwaves about NIL. And while that is entertaining, uh, it's certainly not representative of the vast majority of, of college athletes uh, that could. Uh, have some sort of NIL benefit. Um, what's going on right now with NIL? What can you share us to maybe make it a little more clear to the average high school AD or coach that's listening? 
And uh, I think you're even going to talk about maybe why businesses might want to get involved with uh, NIL. So I'm going to shut up and, and, and let you uh, take over. Yeah, um, and it kind of has you mentioned, you know, that's really the, the football coach um, headlines have really taken off over the past five days or whatnot. And that seems to be what everyone's kind of talking about. But I think that, that for myself and being within an athletic department and seeing, you know, I mean, we're not part of the Power Five, but uh, you know, there's 500 student athletes at uh, San Diego University. We have 450,000 NCAA athletes across the country that can now take advantage of these opportunities. And I think that focusing at the very, very top, the 0.001%, um, while it is causing a bit of disruption in the collegiate space, there's so many other opportunities for these athletes. So uh, yeah, I'd love to discuss a little bit about, you know, get a high level of, of NIL and um, where some local businesses could benefit from partnering with them, please. Well, uh, again, for the average high school AD, and, and you and I have talked about this before, uh, the NIL landscape uh, you know, is changing. Um, what are some things that they should be aware of um, maybe now, um, or, or how can they better plan for serving their athletes' needs, but also making sure that you know, their school programs don't run afoul? Um, any advice for us? Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting in the high school space because as we saw, I think last week or the, the week before, um, Ohio was the first state to propose NIL reform legislation for, for high school athletes. And then actually, um, sorry, not the first state overall, but they were the first ones to propose it and then actually ended up shutting that down. So in the state of Ohio, high school athletes still um, cannot monetize their NIL. I think it's around 10 states now that, that permit their high school athletes. But I've definitely seen that the, the high school level of interest has started to grow and mostly from the club space. Um, I've been reached out to by, you know, from gymnastics to volleyball to soccer, uh, a bunch of, of our Olympic sports actually that are looking to incorporate some NIL education into their college prep camps or um, basically in my mind, it's looking like in the same kind of way that a, let's say a club volleyball team would bring in huddle um, to help with their athletes uh, and make their recruiting videos. But on the other side, it's a additional perk and a benefit within their club that they can pull some of those elite athletes because, hey, we've got access to huddle. And I'm almost seeing the NIL educational programming, at least at the club level, be an additional perk of the club that they're now incorporating into uh, those kind of off the court or off the field offerings. But um, I think it's definitely still a, a wide open space. I mean, really at the college level too, as we're figuring this out. And then the high school, I think is almost, this is the wild west, west I guess that would be like the next frontier or whatnot. But, um, yeah, well, we'll see where it goes. <laughs> yeah, I think I probably retired at just the right time. You know, COVID hit and it was before NIL took off. So, uh, boy, I'm so glad I don't have to navigate this. Um, you know, you mentioned that you had um, a PowerPoint presentation that kind of looks at, you know, the business end of it. Uh, can you go ahead and share that, um, you know, with our listeners, at least the content, uh, this won't be on the, our YouTube channel for a couple of weeks, but, um, you know, maybe share some of the nuggets about that uh, uh, for our podcast listeners. Yeah, of course. And I, I think that, I mean, this is a, a presentation that I've been putting together for, for San Diego State, but I also think that the on the, on the same level that the athletes are trying to navigate this new space and get the education around how to even get access to opportunities. I think on the flip side of that, we see our local businesses, the community, the fans, the supporters of the program that are having the same issues and going, well, first of all, why would I work with college athletes? Second of all, how do I even put together an NIL opportunity? And then third, where do I find the athletes? And so they're trying to navigate this as much as they can as well. So um, yeah, I'd love to share share the presentation and really just hit on some of these um, statistics and, and things that I've managed to pull together to demonstrate the value really of, of working with our college athletes. So um, starting at really just a, a, a high level of, of NIL, right? And I think that this is very basic. So I'll go quickly, but you know, we have our, our name image likeness. And if you look at, I think the easiest example um, is looking at Michael Jordan. Everybody knows Michael Jordan, the name of Michael Jordan. You have your Air Jordans, which are his uh, shoe line, uses his name uh, for the image. Of course, we all probably know what Michael Jordan looks like. And then the likeness really being, you know, any type of uh, cutout of him or anything that revolves around, you know, there's a famous dunking shot of him um, that doesn't have 
really his image, but really is utilizing his likeness. So those three pieces um, are something, you know, our athletes now have been, have been navigating and monetizing through endorsements, licensing appearances, coaching. I'm really hoping the coaching picks up a little bit more because as a former coach, I think there's a ton of opportunity there, but uh, we'll see what they can put together this summer. Um, so looking at, and I get this question quite a bit when I'm even speaking to administrators is why NIL now? Like what really caused this to come to fruition um, in July 1st of 2021? And I, I think that there's about three pieces of it. One of them being the growth of the influencer industry um, and utilizing social media. So social media has only been around now for, I mean, I guess coming up on 20 years, which seems wild, but in terms of actually the social media influencer industry, it's probably about a decade old or maybe eight years old, which means that companies that traditionally were using their marketing budgets to do print advertisements, commercials, um, that kind of thing are now saying, if we wanna hit our target market, maybe we should use um, people on social media who all of their followers fit within our market. So looking at a local restaurant, for example, they want to partner with an influencer that maybe grew up, I'm going to use San Diego as an example since I'm here, but grew up in San Diego and has a, um, some kind of role within the community that makes people from San Diego follow them. Um, second one being the rise, actually, let's look at some of these, uh, oops, wrong direction, sorry. Um, so really just looking at the growth of that industry, it's about 700% growth over the past five years. So from a $1.7 billion industry up to $13.8 billion last year. And this is the influencer uh, industry on social media and how companies are now partnering with those influencers. So, and it, it works. Um, there's been studies time and time again that consumers really, really trust in the recommendations that are made by influencers. So. 77% of shoppers have made a purchase based off of an influencer recommendation. That's a very, very high number. Um, and we, we see it. People are living and breathing on social media. They're following people that they respect and that people who are putting products in front of them. And they're going, well, if this person uses this product, maybe I can use that product as well. Um, second one being here, uh, the gig economy and the growth of entrepreneurship. Uh, I think COVID actually really brought this entrepreneurship side even blasted it uh, probably quicker than what would have happened. But, you know, we're seeing so many new businesses start in the gig economy being that people can pretty much work on their own hours. So that would be like a Lyft, um, Uber, Etsy, creating a little shop for your art or jewelry that you're creating, which I know some college athletes have taken advantage of that as well. Um, and it works really well for college students. And not even needing to be athletes, uh, college students. They have classes that are all over the map um, in terms of one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And so being able to you know, make some money in the hours that they're able to work instead of having a nine to five type job is super, super convenient for students and even more convenient for our student athletes who you know, they have even more limited time than, uh, than their peers. So, and then finally here, which, we all know, but the public awareness of NIL really grew since about 2015 when the Ed O'Bannon case got settled. That was the video game case, as we all know it. And that really made the public aware of a couple of different things. One, that uh, NCAA and the schools were making hundreds of millions of dollars um, off of their revenue generating sports. And the second one being that the athletes were super limited in how they were able to uh, benefit. And, you know, even prior to NIL, an athlete could get an exception and a waiver from the NCAA to make some money, but it was pretty far and few in between. So NIL opened that up for our athletes to be able to um, make some money that time. Um, so looking at here, what is the benefit for local businesses of working with college athletes? Um, I feel like every time a, a local business, you know, they call me at San Diego State and they go, hey, this NIL thing is so new, but why, why would I partner with college athletes? Um, what, what is the benefit for my business and why do college athletes make great ambassadors? So I think a really important note or piece to point out is most of the initial NIL activations are happening on social media. So I think it's at about, um, I don't know, 80% are going through product endorsements. 
And it is the easiest way for an athlete to get started in NIL um, if they have a social media presence. So compared to the US population, college sports fans um, are 1.6 times more likely to have incomes higher than $100,000. And they are massive followers of our college athletes. They wanna follow their lives. They wanna watch them on the court. They wanna watch them on the field. They wanna see what they're doing when they're not on the field, when they're not on the court, when they're not training. Um, and so getting in front of that population for any brands or local businesses is really advantageous to the company. Secondly, being that um, college athletes have a very young audience that are following them. So um, I did a poll recently of San Diego State athletes and I asked them, hey, look at your um, Instagram demographics. If you have your business profile on, they'll be able to see where, um, sorry, what age range is following or interacting with their content. Uh, around or an average of 65% of them were 18 to 24 years old. And that number went up to 86% when you look at 18 to 34 year olds. So that's traditionally a pretty hard market for brands to get in front of. How else are they going to reach, you know, our generation Z and whatnot. So using student athletes to promote their products, their restaurant, their services, again, a very, a very good way to get in front of Generation Z. And then lastly, the local community. So this is something that separates them from those more general influencers or potentially the ones that have, you know, hundreds of millions of followers all across the whole world. College athletes in general aren't going to have that high of a number of followers, but what they do have is that the local community is following them. So the fans that are coming out again to their games, um, to watch them on the court in the field are local. I'll use San Diego as an example again, to the city of San Diego. And at San Diego State, 20% of our their followers are from San Diego. So again, for those local businesses, restaurants, mom and pop shops or whatnot, that it doesn't benefit them as much to reach you know, the, the consumers in Oklahoma or in New York or whatnot. They really are just wanting to focus on San Diego using San Diego State athletes is a good way to get in front of those guys. Um, furthermore here, I'm just looking at what the difference is, again, between using traditional influencers versus college athletes. Um, college athletes have a much more organic following. They get a much higher engagement rate. The, the average percentage um, of engagement for an influencer is about two to three percent. For athletes, it's usually over 10 percent, which is huge. So they're getting it again, not having those hundreds of thousands of followers, but for the few thousand that they do have, a lot of people are seeing their content, engaging, sharing, commenting, all of those things that, that brands are really looking for when they're doing marketing campaigns. Yeah. You, know, you mentioned on one of your earlier slides that um, people reported making purchases. I want to say it was like 77% did so mm -hmm. because of an influencer and I was going to ask you, is that a, one of those self-proclaimed, you know, Twitter influencers, or was that maybe a, an NCAA athlete? But it looks like it's um, separate, that the athletes have much more influence than the influencers. Is that true? Yeah. So that, that study with the 77% number was pulled from a um, social media analytics company that wasn't focused directly on college athletes. Um, I would imagine that potentially if they looked at just college athletes, that number could even be higher. And I think it's, you know, they have the trust and credibility, um, that organic following, and they're, they're not just there to sell things like our traditional right. kind of influencers yeah. are. So um, we don't have those numbers yet. I think we're probably still a year or two out from starting to really understand um, what that could look like if we just did a study of college athletes. But I think that they'll definitely hit that number, if not even push it a little bit higher there. Um, there was a study actually that was done specifically to college athletes around NIL and, and brands um, supporting athletes. And at least for the college fans, I think 77% reported um, that spending money with college athletes is a great way to support them. And so they have a positive kind of imagery um, for the brands that are going out and either sponsoring or hiring student athletes for their marketing campaign. So Again, if you're looking at the local community um, and trying to build your brand and kind of the positive feelings around it, having a visible college athlete to promote the product, I think is a really great way to get some fans on board and um, you know have them stop in your restaurant after the games or, or whatnot. So um, yeah, and I think actually that was a, the Inmar internal data so that they did a 
a thousand randomized athlete social media accounts for the engagement rate. So to get that over 10%. So um, looking for more of these studies to come out because I think that this, this industry for sure needs a lot more transparency in it um, for, for every side, for the athletes, for admins, for coaches, for the brands and whatnot. So soon, soon enough, we're only about a year in. Um, I will say for local brands though, I, I do say that there are some considerations to make before they go to partner with student athletes. And the first one being that they aren't professional influencers. They might not know how to create that fancy content that, that you see when you are dealing with a professional um, content creator that is in that influencer world. And also they don't necessarily know how to drive sales. They're not thinking about the sales funnel, where they fall into it and how to further a consumer along that pathway, which is again, something that traditional influencers are more trained in. So potentially local businesses would have to do some education for the athletes there. But I love that piece of it because that's also benefiting the athlete for something that they can take after they graduate to understand this part of a business um, and to get that education earlier than they should have. Um, second one being kind of compatibility and alignment. And this goes for any brand that's partnering with anyone outside their company. Um, and I think I would even give this example of, you know, a lot of athletes jumped into being barstool athletes last July when NIL opened up. And I think that that limited future opportunities for quite a few college athletes because a brand goes on their social media, their Instagram, uh, to see if they'd make a good partner. And they see in the bio that they're a barstool athlete. And if they don't align with barstool, then potentially that brand isn't going to even want to partner with the athlete. Um, just because of that association. First was a very divisive, you hate them, you love them, wherever you fall on that, it's a different story. But I think that making sure that you align with whatever athlete that, that you're looking to partner with. Um, and then finally, all the rules that we have to deal with still. So we have NCAA interim policy. Um, they came out with more guidance about two weeks ago, basically caught saying that the collectives are considered boosters and no conversations should be happening between boosters, collectives, then recruits or transfers um, before they choose a school. And uh, also you're looking at the university's intellectual property rules, making sure that anything that you're posting on your account um, doesn't necessarily have the marks of the university. Some schools allow you to use the colors. Some will allow student athletes to identify themselves as a athlete of that institution, but it all just kind of differs school to school with their institutional policy. Um, and then finally, there's some new guidelines coming out from the FTC about the um, basically social media legal and branding issues. So making sure that, you know, if you're using an athlete and they're promoting your product, that their post does follow those rules, you know, hashtag ad or advertisement or whatever we, we see sometimes from the influencers. That also falls on the, the student athletes and your company to make sure that you're in compliance and that it's visible that this is a paid activity. Um, for, for the student athletes. Um, I don't think we necessarily need to get into these. Yeah, I think maybe the last part I'll really get into here is just some considerations for if you're looking to put together an NIL opportunity. So first things first, developing your budget. How much are you looking to spend with student athletes over the year? I know that a lot of these initial activations have been for um, product or for services, and some have been monetary compensation. It's really all over the map for how much um, brands and businesses have been investing so far. But figuring out, you know, if um, you, know, you have your full marketing budget, how much of it will you use on social media marketing? And then after that, how much of that will go down to student athletes? Um, what kind of athletes would represent your brand? Well, I get a lot of, uh, a lot of conversations with local businesses that come and go, hey, like, we really would love an athlete of this particular major um, or these particular interests or from this city or from this state as their hometown. And so really considering, you know, what aligns with your brand and what's what's important to you. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be, again, those celebrity style athletes. I think that there are so many athletes that have really unique traits to them and that could really do a really nice job with your company, um, even if they don't have quite the same amount of followers or whatnot as those uh, those celebrity athletes. I don't know what else to call them. <laughs> um, 
what should the medium be? Do you want to bring them in for a public appearance? Do you want, most of the activations happen on Instagram, a lot through Instagram stories. I think the athletes are probably most comfortable with that because it doesn't necessarily live on their profile and it's up for 24 hours, include a link to click. Um, but yeah, figuring that out. And then what are your KPIs? Um, what are your goals from the activation? What are you really looking to get out of this? Is it building your brand? Is it sales? Um, just starting to understand some of those things before, before you reach out and get going. And then finally looking at, you know, are you want to start with potentially just a one-off campaign to see how it goes? Or what are the benefits of a longer campaign? Do you want to work with just one athlete versus a team of athletes or a group across different sports, the same sport? I think the team and group activations are really fun because um, it makes it a lot more comfortable for the athletes. They get to do some things with their teammates that get to create content together. But also for the brand, it allows for just an extra layer of security that if, you know, an athlete gets injured or quits the team or there's some other things that are going on, you have a whole group of athletes that are working to um, working to promote your, your company or your brand. So, um, yeah, I think that just about it for, for businesses and partnering. I know there's a lot of information really quickly, so, <laughs> but I think that for for me, I, I just think there's so much opportunity at the local level um, and it's a win-win, you know, for the, the brands as well as for the athlete and even bringing more visibility to uh, the institution and the different programs. So I'm really looking forward to that piece of it as we keep progressing down this road. Um, I got to ask this last slide, student athlete empowerment. I love that term. Uh, I think it uh, you know, really kind of cuts to the heart of uh, you know, the benefits uh, that NIL can provide for student athletes. Is that, did you coin that term? Is, is that something that's just part of NIL? I've never heard that before. Yeah. So student athlete uh, empowerment is actually a company. Um, it was started by um, uh, Jason Belzner, who is D1 ticker, athletic director, you, um, I think co-founded that. And so this is his um, company. It, I think they're at about eight schools so far and uh, how it works. So ours is called Empower Aztecs. Um, and it really is, it functions as an agency, um, but a passive agency. So they're not going out and soliciting opportunities for athletes of San Diego State. They're not educating our community. But what it does for myself is when I go out and do those things, like I have a webinar with this exact presentation this evening, um, when I go talk to businesses and they go, okay, like I'd love to work with an athlete. Like I want to work with the whole women's tennis team. How do I do it? Um, as an employee of San Diego State, I can't actually facilitate that deal, negotiate it, tell them how much to pay the athletes, tell them the activation. So I needed a platform like this where I go, that's fantastic. Um, go to empoweraztecs.com, fill out this really simple form with as much information as you have. And at that point then, Jason and his team reach out to the business and say, hey, we saw your form come through. Let's talk about what the activation is, the budget. And from there, they take that opportunity to be athletes and the athletes can opt in or opt out or whatnot. So um, it's a really nice, just, I guess, a, a place that is able to do, um, to make those opportunities happen and keeps myself and the coaches and other employees of San Diego State just an arm's length away from those um, actual facilitation of deals. Okay. Again, very cool. Uh, for our listeners, uh, we're visiting with Michelle Meyer, the founder of the NIL Network and the NIL uh, Director at San Diego State University. Uh, we're going to take a real quick break, but we'll be back with some more. Uh, this is Wednesday Wisdom on the Educational AD Podcast. We want to say thanks to Athletic Surveys by Lifetrack for their support of the podcast. Athletic surveys by Lifetrack are a quick, easy, and affordable way for you to collect comprehensive data that allows you to evaluate and improve your entire athletic program. Athletic surveys by Lifetrack also connects you to the 95% of the players and the student athletes who really love your program, and it gives them a voice to help demonstrate the importance that a positive athletic experience has for them. Go to athleticsurveys.com and check out their testimonials and then give them a call at 1-800-738-6466. Or you can email them at info at athleticsurveys.com to get started. 
If you've never used a survey to take the pulse of your parents or your student athletes, you're really missing out. Talk to the folks at Athletic Surveys by Lifetrack and let them help you take your athletic program from good to great. We also want to say thanks to Hometown Ticketing, the leading digital ticketing provider to schools and colleges. You can find out more about what Hometown Ticketing can do for you and your school by going to hometownticketing.com and talk to their experts. Hometown Ticketing, simple and easy online ticketing. Again, we're visiting today on Wednesday Wisdom with Michelle Meyer, the director of uh, NIL for San Diego State University and the founder of the NIL Network. Uh, Michelle, you were telling me that uh, the NIL Network website has a new look. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about it and, and tell our listeners why they should go there. What kind of information are they going to find? Yeah. So, I mean, I founded NIL Network in November of, of 2020. Um, and it was my first time building a website and I really, you know, I was very excited to share resources as much as I could with anyone who wanted it, but it became pretty obvious to me that the user experience just wasn't what it should be. So there's a ton of information on there in terms of articles and different resources and directories and databases and anything you could ever imagine about NIL, but people could not find the resources that they were looking for. And so over the past couple of weeks, um, I've done a massive overhaul of the website and now I am so excited about how it looks because I think it just makes the user experience, for example, you go on the homepage and I've created sub hubs um, for athletes, for coaches, administrators. Um, I'm working on one for brands and then an overall view of the, the industry in general. So people have a better idea of where they should go to get information. And then if you click on any of those kind of sub hubs, based off of my conversations again with athletes, coaches, administrators, and understanding what they're really looking for, um, I give them kind of quick links to the different directories and, and databases and the resources um, that they're looking to find. So, um, for example, for administrators, they're really trying to understand what are other schools around the country doing? Who is investing in what different third party service providers? Who's got these collectives? Um, and so some quick links there. And then another piece that I've just added is, you know, I'm updating my recommended reads every day um, with different NIL articles. And again, it was just kind of hard to navigate. And so now I actually have a, a ticker on the top that just shows like the daily articles and in all of those sub hubs as well. So I have the articles that are specifically for athletes, like how to start a business, what are tax implications, da, 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 the different things that they should be thinking about, which are kind of separate from what our coaches should be thinking about and our administrators. So um, just trying to make it as simple as possible for people to get the information about NIL that they're they're looking for no and again uh, i just love the powerpoint i wish we had uh, uh, a video cast instead of just a podcast uh, people would just have to wait uh, till this gets up on youtube obviously nil network is a way they can reach out to you but uh if somebody wants to shoot you an email um what's the best way to get in touch with michelle meyer yeah um michelle nilnetwork.com or i'm pretty active on uh their Instagram account as well. And that's just that NIL network too. So yeah, reach out. All right. Well, Michelle Meyer, NIL network. Thanks so much for sharing on Wednesday wisdom and all the best uh, for the San Diego state program as well. Awesome. Thanks Jake. Thanks for having me. For our listeners, remember the zoom recordings of all of our interviews are getting uploaded to the educational AD podcast, YouTube channel. We appreciate you listening today. Come back again next Wednesday for more Wednesday wisdom and just about every day for the Educational AD Podcast. Thanks again. We'll see you next time. Again, we appreciate you listening to Wednesday Wisdom and to the podcast. And we do want to recognize our sponsors. Uh, please visit them uh, because they are all great, great programs. Uh, Wall of Fame by Vital Signs. Um, our state association, the FIAAA, has a Wall of Fame console for our organization's hall of fame it is a very very cool program you really need to reach out to them uh, also athletic surveys by lifetrack most of my career was spent at the private school level and we use surveys in the classroom in our athletic program in all facets not to make you know monumental decisions but to just gather data to help us make our programs better 
uh, you know, listening to what the student athletes say, listening to what the parents say, uh, really is a valuable tool. So talk to the folks at Athletic Surveys by Lifetrack. Um, hometown ticketing. Uh, I did not use hometown ticketing. I, re I retired before online ticketing became uh, um, uh, part of the, the landscape now. But I can tell you in the two years since I've retired, I've talked to a number of athletic directors who swear by hometown ticketing, uh, the product as well as their customer service. So I'm happy to have them as a sponsor. Check out hometown ticketing. Um, Huddle, as a football coach, uh, I used Huddle. And as an athletic director, we were a huddle school. Our coaches used huddle, huddle uh, video and the analytics. We had a huddle focus camera in our gym. It was just fantastic. You know, check out huddle.com for more information. Um, also, Sideline Interactive. We were one of the first schools in Florida to have a Sideline Interactive video board in our gym. Um, our sponsorships uh, paid for it uh, within the first couple of months, and it continued to be a great source of revenue. And it was a great addition to our game day experience, just like the ad says. Uh, also, Final Forms. Uh, Final Forms helps us run our state conference here in Florida. Uh, they can do a lot more than that. Uh, check out Final Forms dot com forward slash Jake and our newest sponsor area scouts um, area scouts uh, developed what they call the base BASE assessment uh, for student athletes uh, they work with coaches at the youth high school and college level go to area scouts.com for more information and again thanks for listening to Wednesday wisdom and the educational 80 podcast